Greetings again, fellow seekers. I hope you enjoyed our brief stay at Sirius. I know that unless you're really into history, there wasn't much to see. Potential mining colonies, solar collectors, and stalazer highways aside. Thanks to my fellow seeker Julian Williams for the vision. But I'm not Isaac Arthur, so I must restrict my speculations to what our telescopically augmented senses can reveal. For the uninitiated, this is a guided tour of the nearest stars to our sun, following the most idiosyncratic map in the universe. If you are new here, I highly recommend starting at the beginning, where you will gain a thorough tutorial on the nature of the map, the distances involved, and the origins of names like Wolf, Lisa, and Ross. So, jumping over the eight parsec chasm leading to Gliese 3135, a medium-sized red dwarf about which I can glean nothing, we arrive at this brown dwarf, which is, believe it or not, one of the most fascinating stops on the trip. Not only is, let's just call it 714, the fourth closest system to the sun, at just 2.3 parsecs, it is also one of the most recently discovered found in April 2014 by Kevin Lerman of Lerman 16 fame. Before I go any further, I should say that we still know very little about this object, so the implications are still very much implied. But even so, they are pretty astounding. On paper, at least, 714 is a Y-class brown dwarf. In other words, a small, stellar object more similar to a planet than to a star except that models for Y-class brown dwarfs estimate that the object has a mass of between 3 and 10 Jupiter masses, well below the standard 13 Jupiter mass minimum for fusion of deuterium, the defining qualification for a brown dwarf. And its surface temperature is believed to lie near 250 kelvins, equivalent to Mars and far colder than even the coldest known brown dwarf. Such a rare beast is 714 that as of 2020, Nothing like it has been found since, despite several surveys of our near neighborhood. All of which raises the very simple question, is 714 a brown dwarf? I mean, if 714 were happily swinging around another star, even another Y dwarf, it would be a planet, no questions asked. So, can it be a planet now? Not officially. The IAU, the international body concerned with naming and classifying things in space, Cares not for origins. How or why an object is where it is, it leaves to the astronomers to figure out. It is only interested in what and where things are now. And right now, 714 is an object of stellar composition free floating in interstellar space. Which makes it not a planet, but a sub brown dwarf. A term so boring even the IAU press release suggested it be changed. It hasn't. If 714 is a planet, that raises the question of which system it was ejected from. Unfortunately, given its estimated age of over 3 billion years, we will likely never know. 714 has been around the galaxy at least 10 times since being so callously kicked from its cradle, and its neglectful mother is probably living her stellar life in another, hopefully more boring, spiral arm. Two parsecs south and slightly coreward, we arrive at Gliese 1061. On its own, the star has little to offer. It's essentially a slightly smaller, slightly dimmer version of Proxima Centauri. But in one respect, that makes it ideal. Small dim stars are bad at hiding planets, and ever since finding Proxima B in 2016, the Red Dots collaboration has been side-glancing every dim star in our neighborhood to catch them in the act. And in 2019, an affiliated group using the European Southern Observatory's High Accuracy Radial Velocity Planet Searcher, or HARPS, announced the discovery of three terrestrial-sized planets in Gliese 1061 spectrograph. The three planets' minuscule years are in a near 1 to 4 ratio, with the closest at 3.2 Earth days, the second at 6.7 Earth days, and the third at 13 Earth days. Kepler's laws ensure their orbital distances aren't quite as harmonious with the closest at 3.1 million kilometers, the second at 5.2 million, and the third at 8.1 million. All three of these worlds are between 1 and 2 Earth masses in size, meaning that at a glance, they likely would not appear dissimilar to planets in our system. And it would be a nostalgic glance, because D, 
the farthest planet, just happens to be in 1061's habitable zone, making it the second closest potentially habitable world to our own, after the much put upon Proxima b. It even has one advantage over poor Proxima. 1061 is a far quieter and less active star than our nearest neighbor, meaning life is likely to have a far easier time of it. But of course, as always, there's a qualification. As we learned with Proxima b, being in the habitable zone doesn't necessarily equate with a verdant paradise. D's equilibrium temperature, or temperature if it lacked an atmosphere, is 218 K, which is close to that of Mars. Of course, D is larger than Earth, which means it beats Mars in every other weight class. It could very well have things Mars does not, such as extensive volcanism, a thick atmosphere, or even a magnetic field. Of course, it also may have none of these things, which just goes to show how overdue our discovery of Earth 2.0 now is. Slightly coreward and nine parsecs south, we come to this fairly typical brown dwarf binary. Despite it being a binary, it seems no one knows what its combined mass is. One parsec north, we find the medium-sized red dwarf LP99184, and four parsecs further north, we get to... Dennis. Well, given that it was found by the European Southern Observatory, I probably should call it Denis. Denis, or the Deep Near Infrared Survey of the Southern Sky, the other S's are presumably implied, was, well, exactly what it says. A survey of the southern sky in the near infrared conducted from 1996 until 2001. Such surveys are ideal for catching the largest brown dwarfs, known as L class, since they shine mainly in the infrared. And this brown dwarf happens to be the closest L class to Earth. Although we don't know precisely how big Denis is, it is certainly on the larger side for a brown dwarf, at over 25 Jupiter masses. Though despite this, it is remarkably cool with a surface temperature of just 1,300 kelvins, cool enough for water vapor, methane, and even ammonia to form in its clouds, making it essentially a superheated version of Neptune. A ways eastward of Denis, and two parsecs north, we come to Captain Star. If you missed my video on the Oort cloud, Jacobus Captain was an early 20th century Dutch astronomer who pioneered the plotting of stellar motions through the Milky Way. Unsurprisingly, the star named for him had the fastest motion of any previously known star, until 1916, when the far livelier Barnard star was discovered. Captain is a decent-sized red dwarf, about twice the size and eight times the luminosity of Proxima Centauri. It's also one of our old friends, a B.Y. Draconis variable, a star so magnetically active that its star spots can be seen across interstellar space. Its metallicity is just 13% that of the Sun, indicating that it is ancient. Estimates for its age run between 10 and 12 billion years, the same age as the similarly bounding Barnard star. It moves in the opposite direction to the galaxy's rotation, and forms part of a gang of stars in a similar motion called the Captain Moving Group. This group's chemical makeup suggests they may, or may not, have been expelled from Omega Centauri a globular cluster 5,000 parsecs away that is likely the remains of a galaxy our own devoured millions of years ago. But by far the most interesting thing about Captain Star isn't on the map. In 2014, astronomers using HARPS tentatively identified two super-Earth-sized planets in orbit around Captain Star, respectively about a third and a half the mass of Uranus. The closer planet, B, is believed to be just within the star's habitable zone though with an estimated equilibrium temperature of just 205 K, or a brisk day on Mars, its atmosphere would have to be substantial to support any life. Assuming, of course, that the planet is there in the first place. Captain's intense stellar activity makes tracking the shadow of a planet an uncertain prospect at best. Study after study since 2014 has confirmed and then refuted their existence. That said, if Captain B does exist, it would be the oldest potentially habitable planet ever detected. Right next to Captain Star, but three parsecs south, we get to E. Eridni. Not to be confused with Epsilon Eridni, apparently, despite being all too easy to do, E. Eridni is a G-class star like the Sun. Though slightly dimmer, it is still brighter than either Tau Ceti or Alpha Centauri b. It has a high proper motion relative to the galactic neighborhood, 
and lower metallicity than the Sun, suggesting that, like Barnard's star, it originated in the galactic halo, migrating with another galaxy as it collided with the Milky Way. It also suggests that, again like Barnard's star, Eiridni is ancient, possibly as old as 10 billion years. All this would make it an El Dorado for habitable planets, and in 2011, three super-Earth-sized planets were detected around Eiridni, all, unfortunately, too close to their star to be habitable. Other planets have been tentatively detected farther out, but remain unconfirmed. In 2012, a dust disk was detected around Eiridni, roughly analogous to the Sun's Kuiper belt, but slightly closer in, comprising roughly the distance from Uranus to Neptune. Rimward of, and in line with Eiridni, we get to LP94420, a dim red dwarf, or perhaps a bright and thus young brown dwarf, that barely qualifies as M-class. At that low temperature, dust can form in a star's upper atmosphere, which, combined with LP's fast rotation of just 4.5 hours, creates weather phenomena. Spectroscopy suggests that LP's atmosphere contains a large amount of lithium, a relatively rare element in cosmic terms, as well as a haze of titanium oxide. Following the dividing line coreward and 10 parsecs north, we arrive at Wolf 358. Also known as Gliese 402, Wolf 358 is a decently sized red dwarf, about a quarter the mass and a third the radius of the Sun, making it roughly analogous to Ross 128 or Kruger 60. As per the most outgoing red dwarfs, it is a B Y Draconis variable. Continuing to follow the divider coreward, we reach Gliese 3622, a flary little red dwarf about the size of Wolf 359. And moving on from there, we reach uh, this brown dwarf, of which very little is known, save that it is Y class, meaning it is close to being a rogue planet. Five parsecs north, we find another Dini. Like 944, Dini J1048 3956 lies in the boundary between being an ultra dim red dwarf and an exceptionally bright brown dwarf. The fact that it's a flare star would suggest it belongs in the former class. Next to that, and six parsecs north, is the Proxima ish star Gliese 1154. And next to that, 14 parsecs south, is the double K type star Pieridni. The two stars orbit each other with a period of about 475 years. I have to wonder why so little is known about this system, given its potential for habitable planets. A ways coreward, we arrive at Wolf 461, a dim red dwarf, west and rimward of which is the far more interesting Wolf 437. Also known as Gliese 486, Wolf 437 is a large red dwarf about a third the size of the Sun. Although its metallicity is close to that of the Sun, its slow rotation suggests it is very old though precisely how old is uncertain. The most exciting finding about Wolf 461 came this year, when a joint European-American team using the Carmine spectrograph in Spain identified a planet orbiting it with a period of less than one and a half days. Obviously, this planet, which is about three times the mass of Earth, is unlikely to be a halcyon paradise. Unlike most of the blasted hellscapes found around other stars over the last 30 years, Wolf 437's planet is transiting it from our point of view, which means that if it has an atmosphere, we should be able to see it. A planet three times the mass of Earth orbiting a star 22 times closer than Mercury could give us an unprecedented window into the nature of planets in extremis. Could an atmosphere survive at all so close to its star? Of what could it possibly be composed? We should get the answer once James Webb begins operation. Coward of and in line with Wolf 437, we arrive at the white dwarf Wolf 489. With a surface temperature of just 5,000 kelvins, Wolf 489 is believed to have radiated a good deal of its internal heat, and thus to be quite old, at around 5 billion years. Its extreme age means that it is likely dimmed from the radiant white of a white dwarf to a dull orange. Next to it, but eight parsecs south, we come to SCR 1845-6357. Only discovered in 2004, and only confirmed as a binary in 2006, SCR is a dim red dwarf about half the size of Proxima Centauri, orbited by a large brown dwarf of about 50 Jupiter masses, approaching stellar mass in size. 
at a distance of 4.1 AU. West of that, we arrive at the white dwarf Gliese 915. Actually, it has a lot of names, but I'm sticking with one that's familiar. Only slightly larger than Earth, like all white dwarfs, 915 is an ultra-dense dead star composed of degenerate matter. Its mass is 85% that of the Sun, and its surface gravity is a quarter million times stronger than Earth's. Its relatively hot surface temperature, 8600 kelvins, suggests it has been cooling for between 1.5 and, and 2 billion years. In life, it likely existed as a B-type blue giant star, seven times as massive as the Sun, which died after only 70 million years. Unusually for a white dwarf, 915 possesses a strong magnetic field, about a million times stronger than Earth's, probably generated by convection currents fueled by the cooling interior. Right next to 915, but 14 parsecs north, we come to Gliese 514, a large red dwarf about half the size of the Sun. And next to that, and 9 parsecs south, we come to one of the bigger names in our neck of the woods, Epsilon Indy. There's a strong chance you've at least heard of Epsilon Indy, though you might not know why. Like Tau Ceti, it has gained a modern mystique independent of the stars of antiquity, largely due to its association with Ceti, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Although difficult to tell from this map, Epsilon Indy is remarkably close to Earth, just 3.6 parsecs, and, at roughly three quarters of the mass of the Sun, it is one of Ceti's holy grails, a K type star. K type stars, while dimmer than G type stars like the Sun, have much longer main sequence lives, up to 34 billion years, and are less active, producing far less UV radiation. Epsilon Indy's metallicity is close to the Sun's, meaning it is likely of a similar age. Jill Tarter, Carl Sagan's heir apparent and the inspiration for his heroine Ellie Arroway in his novel Contact, listed Epsilon Indy as the top target for any potential habitable planet search. In 2003, Epsilon Indy was found to be orbited by a binary of large, T-class brown dwarfs at a distance of 1500 AU. Their masses make them more star-like than planet-like. In 2018, astronomers using the HARP spectrograph confirmed the existence of a planet orbiting Epsilon Indy, a super-Jovian of about three Jupiter masses, orbiting at a distance of 11.6 AU, with an orbital period of 45 years. That makes it, to date, the closest Jovian planet found to our own solar system, though that will almost certainly change in future. None of these companions make Epsilon Indy in any way inimical to life, and in fact only serve to whet appetites for what treasures the systems may reveal when the James Webb Telescope finally turns its eye to it. Slightly coreward, and 11 parsecs north, we arrive at this brown dwarf. Well, not particularly small for brown dwarf, it's a T-type, placing it near the larger end. It is remarkably cool, with a surface temperature of just 500 kelvins, suggesting it may be quite old. Following the dividing line westward and one parsec south, we come to Gliese 832. Gliese 832 is that rarest of beasts, a quiet red dwarf. That is to say, unlike other red dwarfs, it doesn't erupt in spasms of fiery doom every few years. In fact, UV measurements suggest that, as stars go, Gliese 832 is even calmer than our own sun. That, together with its relatively slow rotation of about 45 days, indicates it is very old, with estimates placing its age around 9.25 billion years. Also, searches to date have yet to locate any cometary disk, suggesting any planets will be relatively free of impacts. If optimists in the search for extrasolar life were looking for an archetypal good red dwarf, they could do little better than Gliese 832. As if to tie the bow, two planets have been found so far in orbit around Gliese 832. One, Gliese 832b, a gas giant about two-thirds the size of Jupiter, orbiting at 3.5 AU, or the outer rim of the asteroid belt in our system. The other, Gliese 832c, a super-Earth of about 5.4 Earth masses, orbiting at around 0.16 AU, or less than half the distance of Mercury. Nonetheless, that places the planet on the inner edge of Gliese 832's habitable zone, granting it an equilibrium temperature of 253K, almost identical to Earth's. But of course, it's never that simple. 
Models suggest that Gliese 832b's orbit is highly elliptical, and when at the closest distance to its star, it may receive a solar flux nearly 50% higher than Earth's, enough to boil oceans. Still, many accidents can befall a planet on the road to habitability, as the various visions for Proxima b show. Who are we to prejudge? Five parsecs south, we arrive at this brown dwarf, about which I can find absolutely no information. Sixteen parsecs north, we arrive at Ross 837, a medium-sized red dwarf about which, again, I can find no information. Eastward and ten parsecs south, we arrive at Lakaya 8760, a star on the very high edge of red dwarfdom. Almost a K-type, it has frequently been mistaken for one. That, combined with its relatively close distance, means it is the only known red dwarf to be occasionally visible to the naked eye. In 1979, it got outed as a red dwarf when it was found to be a flare star. No planets have been found around Lakaya to date, but given that Lakaya is believed to be less than half a billion years old, any planets aren't likely to be habitable. Next, and 10 parsecs north, we come to this wide binary of two low metallicity brown dwarfs. While their ages are yet to be fully constrained, they are believed to be relatively old. The two are separated by a distance of between 90 and 100 AU. Next to that, and seven parsecs back south, we come to Wolf 1061. On its own, Wolf 1061 has little to distinguish it. It's an average-sized red dwarf about the third of the size of the sun. But it has an unusually calm surface, which makes it a superb candidate for planet detections. And indeed, in 2015, a team of astronomers in Australia dug through ten years of archive footage from the HARP spectrograph found the signals for three terrestrial-sized planets, one of which, C, might lie on the inner edge of 1061's habitable zone. Despite this, its equilibrium temperature is just 223 K, about 20 degrees lower than Earth's, meaning that unless its atmosphere has a high greenhouse content, it is likely an ice world. Further west and in line with the sun, we arrive at Ross 154. Proxima-ish red dwarf that flares every two days. Its relatively fast rotation suggests it is quite young, perhaps younger than a billion years. And now, as we near the end of the current leg of this journey, we come to one of the oddest configurations on this map. Fomalhaut. A pronunciation I decided upon after several long minutes of listening to Arabic speakers online. Fam al haut the mouth of the whale so-called because it forms part of the constellation of Piscis austrinus, the southern fish. It is one of four B-type stars in our solar neighborhood, the other three being Sirius, Vega, and Altair. It is the 18th brightest star in the night sky, and its position in the sky, away from many bright stars, makes it useful for navigation. In ancient Persian astronomy, it was one of the four royal stars, alongside Aldebaran, Regulus, and Antares, that govern the four quadrants of the sky. But Fomalhaut, unlike its brother Sirius, is a star much more of the modern age than of the ancient. Modern astronomy has found the star to be lord of its own peculiar empire. Its not spectacular mass, barely twice that of the sun, holds in its sway stars so distant that at first they appear to be not connected at all. T.W. Piscis Ostrini, or Fomalhaut b, and LP87610, or Falmahat C, are separated from one another, and their distant parent, by almost a parsec of distance, and about 7.5 degrees across the sky, about 13 full moons. Across such an epic gulf, the star's orbits require tens of millions of years to complete. Based on their respective positions on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, astronomers estimate the age of the triple system to be 440 million years. This age means that whatever systems may be in place around them are still in formation. But even by the standards of budding planetary systems, Falmahaut's is fairly metal. To date, three debris disks have been identified around Falmahaut. A disk of smoke-like particles lies at 0.1 AU, a second disk of larger particles extends from 0.4 to 1 AU, or about the distance from Mercury to Earth, a third outer belt, sometimes referred to somewhat inadequately as Falmahaut's Kuiper belt, extends from 133 to 158 AU from its star, about four times as distant as our sun's Kuiper belt, 
and twice as wide. The ring is decidedly elongated, granting it the nickname the Eye of Sauron. The inner edge of this ring is extremely sharp, suggesting it is being sculpted by as yet unseen planets, while the outer ring extends for tens of AU into a halo of dust produced by furious collisions of the objects within. A possible fourth disk, lying at the star's snow line, and thus analogous to the solar system's asteroid belt, but again about four times the distance, has been inferred but not imaged. That planets exist in the system appears to be a given, and in 2008, Hubble appeared to directly image one of them, lying, as predicted, just inside the system's outer ring, the first extrasolar planet to be directly imaged in visible light. Except planets are generally believed to radiate in the infrared. Ours certainly does, but apparently not Thalmahaut B. Also, planets are not generally known to gradually disappear, but over the course of a decade, that's exactly what Thalmahaut B appeared to do. It seemed that Thalmahaut B was the expanding cloud resulting from a massive collision. Whether that collision involved a planet or simply two large non-planetary objects has yet to be determined. Thalmahaut B may still possess a planet at the heart of its cloud, just too small to be detected. Yet another problem, waiting for James Webb to put it to bed. As yet, less is known about Falmahout's two long-distance partners, though they do show signs of their paramour's edgelord nature. T.W. Piscus Ostrini, or Falmahout B, capital B, like many red dwarfs, is a B.Y. Draconis variable, a star so violently magnetic that its star spots are visible across interstellar distances. Except, Falmahout B, capital B, isn't a red dwarf. It's an orange K-type star three-quarters the mass of the sun. An exoplanet, mercifully far from its star, was tentatively detected in 2019, using that most unreliable of planetary detection methods, astrometry. The only thing we think we know about it is that it orbits its star in less than 55 years. LP87610, or Fulmahout C, is the most distant of this turbulent threesome currently residing at 2.5 light-years from an aloof significant other, like whom it has a gigantic debris disk, extending from 10 to 40 AU, roughly from Saturn to Pluto in our system. Unlike capital B, it is actually a red dwarf, about the size and temperature of Proxima Centauri. Seemingly part of the Falmahout system, but actually 11 parsecs above it, is the binary star system Chi Bootis. The primary star of the system is a G-type star like the Sun, only, astoundingly, it is also a B.Y. Draconis variable, with a period of just 10 days, compared to 27 days for the Sun. Such raging activity and speedy rotation suggests it is very young, at just 200 million years old. The secondary in the system is a K-type star, about two-thirds the size of the Sun, that orbits its primary once every 151 years. Should any planets ever have the chance to form in the system, they would have to keep within 4 AU to avoid being disrupted by their star's gravity. The primary possesses an infrared excess, suggesting it has a small debris disk about a quarter the size of our solar system's Kuiper belt. West of Fomahaut C and one parsec south is the solitary K-type star Gliese 884, for which, given that it's a K-type star, you'd think there'd be more interest. Passing by this solitary T-class brown dwarf, about which I can find no information, we arrive, at last, at Gliese 876. As a star, Gliese 876 is strikingly dull. A red dwarf and B.Y. Draconis variable about a third the size of the Sun, it could be any of about 50 stars we've already visited. In all other respects, however, Gliese 876 is extraordinary. Gliese 876 is an honored veteran of the current age of exoplanet detection. Its first planet, Gliese 876 b, was detected all the way back in 1998 by the now disgraced pioneering exoplanet hunter Jeffrey Marcy. It was the sixth exoplanet found after 51 Pegasi b, with further planets found in its orbit in 2001, 2005, and 2010. As per usual with red dwarfs, the four worlds all orbit very closely to one another, all within the orbit of Mercury, with the closest completing an orbit in less than two days. So close, in fact, are they orbit that the second, third, and fourth planets 
are known to be locked in a Laplace resonance, the same gravitational shoving contest that torments the first three Galilean moons of Jupiter. For every four orbits made by the second planet, C, the third planet, B, it makes sense in context, makes two, and the fourth, E, like I said, it makes sense, makes one. Among Jupiter's moons, these gravitational tugs raise tides strong enough to transform the inner moon Io into a volcanic nightmare, and the middle moon, Europa, into a world of seething water and cracking ice. However, we know that 876 C and B are Jupiter-sized gas giants, not terrestrial planets, so the effect of the energy imparted would be very different. This also unfortunately limits the possibility for habitable worlds in the system. While C lies on the inner edge of 876's habitable zone, any Pandora-like moons in orbit around it would be in danger of being destroyed by tidal interactions between the planet and the star. While the middle two planets B and C are classic Jovian gas giants, the innermost planet, D, is a terrestrial planet about seven times more massive than Earth. Wikipedia's image of Gliese 876d is an elegantly flattering depiction, though in truth the planet more likely resembles a cross between Venus and Io. Barely three million kilometers from its star, the planet is likely bathed in many kinds of solar radiation, and likely has permanent aurorae. If its atmosphere has not been blasted away by 876's solar wind, or the frequent flares that red dwarfs like 876 are prone to, it is almost certainly a dense, thick soup similar to Venus's. One intriguing hypothesis suggests that D might have originated as a gas giant, like its more distant brethren, but migrated inward, and thus had its atmosphere partially blasted away by its proximity to its star. This would transform D into a water Venus, with a thick atmosphere holding down a superheated ocean of liquid water, much like Venus's atmosphere is composed overwhelmingly of supercritical carbon dioxide. This, it must be said, is not likely. Despite its closeness to its star, D has an eccentricity of 0 0.2, comparable to Mercury. That means that its orbit is noticeably elongated, and the planet comes periodically much closer to its star. This regular gravitational pulse creates tidal forces similar to those on Io, but supercharged. The energy imparted by these forces is likely sufficient to render D's surface completely molten. The final known planet in the system, E, is a planet very similar in mass, and likely given its distance from its star, temperature, and composition, to Uranus. And that's all we know about it. Hints of other planets, and even a debris disk, have emerged in years since, but none have been confirmed. And that's it. That's the end of the second ring. I don't know if I'll continue with this series, at least immediately. As you may have noticed, the ratio of interesting stars to boring ones has steadily increased as the series has gone on, and while there are plenty of interesting stars left, such as Altair, Delta Bavonis, and Gliese 581, I may simply focus on them individually rather than rake through the entire swarm. As the year wraps up, I must now turn my attention to my Halloween episode, the end of the year compilation, and, of course, my series on what makes the new year new. Assuming, of course, that COVID doesn't delay it again. This has been a fascinating trip, on which I have likely learned as much as you. I assure you, this will not be the last trip we take. A special thank you to Singularity G3 on Twitter, whose unique illustrations gave our adventure its particular flavor. I must get into the habit of saying this. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Bon voyage, fellow seekers.